In the heart of America, there is a superhighway paved with steel, a major artery in which drums the pulse of the largest railroad in North America, three pairs of steel rails, each over 100 miles long, resound in a daily symphony of big thundering diesel engines, accompanied by thousands of steel wheels. This is the Triple Track Main, Union Pacific's Kearney Sub. Running between North Platte and Grand Island, Nebraska, the Kearney subdivision covers most of that distance as a triple track main that historically has seen well over 100 trains per day. Seven Idea Productions visited in August of 2021, and although traffic is not what it used to be, there is still a lot of great rail action on the Kearney. Manifest trains run to and from Bailey Yard in North Platte. Monster coal trains up to three miles long pound the rails. Hotshot intermodals race across the wide open spaces. This is your ticket to the action. From North Platte's Bailey Yard, to Gibbon Junction, to Grand Island, and everywhere in between. This is the Carney Sub, Union Pacific's triple track main. Union Pacific's Kearney subdivision traverses the heart of Nebraska, covering 137.8 miles between Platte River and East Grand Island. This portion of the original Transcontinental Railroad follows the Platte River on its eastward course to the Missouri. Likewise, we will be traveling west to east through Keith, Maxwell, Pawnee, and through the famous buttermilk curves near Brady, then on to Gothenburg. Willow Island, Cozad, Dar, Lexington, Overton, Elm Creek, and Kearney. The triple track portion ends at Gibbon Junction, where the Marysville subdivision makes connections to the southeast in Kansas. Gibbon Junction is a busy place, and we will spend some extra time here before continuing through Shelton and Wood River, wrapping up at the popular BNSF flyover at Grand Island. Since its grand opening on June 26, 2008, the Golden Spike Tower has become an iconic landmark in North Platte. The eight-story tower and visitor center offer a grand view of Bailey Yard, paired with a wealth of information on railroad operations and history. The tower is open daily to the public, but if you visit during North Platte's rail days in August, you can be treated to a special night tour. Tonight's visit comes complete with a light show as a summertime thunderstorm moves across central Nebraska. From the open viewing platform on the seventh floor, the vast expanse of Bailey Yard opens before you. 
sitting on 2,850 acres, measuring over 8 miles long and averaging 1,000 yards wide, Bailey Yard made the Guinness World Record book in 1995 as the largest railroad classification yard in the world. It contains 200 separate tracks totaling 315 miles in total length, designated as the North Platte Terminal Subdivision on UP timetables. All traffic in Bailey Yard is controlled by the command center, located right on the property, and is tied to UP's system-wide dispatching center in Omaha. Two hump yards operate around the clock, one for westbound trains and one for eastbounds. A cut of cars is being pushed over the 34-foot tall east hump. The cars are uncoupled and allowed to roll down into one of 65 bowl tracks. Retarders control the speed of each car, and computer-controlled switches line the cars to the proper track, depending on destination. We speed up the video to show you this interesting process. Directly north of the tower, the west hump is also in action tonight. This hump is 20 feet high, and cars are sorted into one of 49 bowl tracks below. In real time, the two humps can sort around 3,000 cars per day, although the actual number can vary greatly with the ebb and flow of the economy. Switchers work throughout the yard, handling the monotonous task of moving cars. These former SD40-2s are paired as a cow-calf set, numbered UPY 316 and 416. The 316 is now an SD40N. It is mothered to the Y416, which is designated as a PS6B slug. Its engine has been removed, and the fuel tank is filled with concrete for added weight. The cab is fully operational, making it easy for the crew to work in either direction. The engines are working the pullback, grabbing cars from the eastbound bowl track and moving them to the eastbound departure yard. Pullback crews also grab any cars that weren't properly coupled after rolling into the bowl. The yard has three separate locomotive fueling and servicing centers, where road power can take on fuel and sand. The eastbound run-through is located next to the diesel repair shop, which contains 11 stalls for handling bigger jobs than simply splash and go. There is nothing like seeing Bailey Yard at night, and if you're ever in North Platte during their annual Rail Day celebration, it is definitely worth a visit to the Golden Spike Tower. The 2021 celebration coincided with the arrival of Big Boy No. 4014, which laid over for a couple of days on its summer tour of 10 states. The big World War II era steam locomotive rests near the site of the North Platte Station and Canteen, which provided refreshments and hospitality to soldiers on their way to war. Staffed by local citizens, the Canteen operated between Christmas Day 1941 and April 1, 1946, and served nearly 7 million soldiers that passed through North Platte on troop trains during World War II. The depot and canteen are gone, the site marked by this plaque along East Front Street across from the grain elevators. The evening thunderstorms have moved on, and all is quiet in North Platte. In the morning, Big Boy will enter the Kearney subdivision on its journey across Nebraska.
The morning of August 8, 2021 started with a blood-red sunrise over the North Platte River as fog mixed with smoke from distant wildfires burning in the west. The Kearney subdivision officially begins near here at Platte River, milepost 282.0 on UP's Council Bluffs area timetable. The triple track portion of the Kearney sub runs from here to Gibbon Junction, 106.9 miles to the east. The near track, Main 3, is the eastbound track. The far track, Main 1, is westbound, and Main 2, the middle track, is the passing track where higher priority trains are run around slower unit coal trains and the like. Although that is the general rule for running trains on the Kearney, you will soon see that is not always the case. This morning, Big Boy 4014 is scheduled for an 8 o'clock departure, and a distant whistle reassures us the steam special is almost ready to go. While waiting, our first train of the day, UP 7911 West approaches North Platte on Main 2. The trailing four-axle units are GP60s. They both originally wore scarlet and gray. The 1089 was lettered for cotton belt, numbered SSW 9706, and the 1061, the SP 9765. The train rounds the curve as it approaches Platte River. In the early 2000s, it was not uncommon to see over 150 trains per day using the triple track main. Various factors including the decline in coal traffic, the economy with COVID-19, and precision scheduled railroading with fewer, longer trains have all played a role in the downturn. That being said, this is still a great place to watch trains. Although coal traffic has dropped significantly in the past decade, coal trains still dominate the Kearney sub. With a big boy lined onto Main 3, UP 6526 heads east on Main 2 with an extra long train of black diamonds from the Powder River Basin in Wyoming. A common practice on the Kearney sub is to take two unit coal trains and put them together as one long train. These super trains have well over 200 cars, an excess of 35,000 tons, and approach three miles in length. Six engines power this train. In addition to the two GEs on the point, three more units work mid-train by remote control with an additional engine on the rear. We will see several of these monsters during our program.
It's a slow Sunday morning in North Platte. Outside of the trains, the only traffic we saw on the east end of town were of the bovine variety. A couple of bulls take a stroll down East 8th Avenue near the stockyards. Strolling our way on Main 3, Big Boy number 4014 finally departs North Platte. Behind the tenders is EMD SD70M number 4015, the Art Lockman tool car, the head end power car Howard Fogg, the Lynn Nystrom baggage car, seven hoppers to assist in braking effort, and a bay window caboose number 25809, adding a nice conclusion to the steam special. As we travel across Nebraska, we pass through what seems to be endless farmland, miles of corn and hay fields along the Platte River. Yet what we see is only a small glimpse of America's fruited plain. Between Platte River and West Keith, an elaborate wayside detector covers all three mains. It is a little more complex than a typical dragging equipment hotbox detector with a multitude of sensors and high-resolution cameras that cover both sides of each track. It is capable of scanning trains at track speed of up to 60 miles per hour, looking for anomalies. UP 6578 West holds short of the scanner on Main 1 and is passed by UP 5736 West with a stack train on Main 2. Smoke hung in the air on the first day of filming on the triple track main, but thankfully it diminished the farther east we went. After crossing the Platte River, the railroad takes a southeast bearing through Maxwell and Brady. 
A flashing yellow shows on Main 2 near milepost 278 for UP 6599 East. This is another double coal train running 2x3x1. Two by by Mile post 275 puts us right between West and East Keith. We have a hot rail on Main 3 as UP 7868 takes an eastbound manifest slowly toward Maxwell. In the distance, the headlights of a westbound are visible. The train is stopping short of East Keith due to track work on Main 2. Main 1 is occupied this morning by several westbound empty coal trains, so essentially this is a single track railroad at Keith. A third train slows to a stop on Main 2 behind the eastbound at West Keith. It will have to wait its turn to cross over to Main 3.
Wild sunflowers are a very prominent trackside decoration as we head through Nebraska. We found them especially thick at Brady Curve east of here. With UP7868 out of the way, the Omaha dispatcher has lined the next eastbound over to Main 3. UP4542 leads a local out of North Platte bound for Lexington. A former Mopac GP38-2 number 829 assists the SD70M. There is no mistaking its non-turbocharged diesel engine. With the local out of the way, UP-9032 West gets a shot at Main 3 as it drags its manifest toward North Platte. UP 5737 West leads an empty coal train that approaches East Keith on Main 2.
Keith is a significant location on the Kearney sub. Westbound train crews change radio frequencies from channel 24 to channel 38 to communicate with the UP North Platte terminal dispatcher. The radio display sign is located to the right of the signals on main one. To the east, train movements are controlled by Omaha Dispatcher 21 all the way to Grand Island. UP's overland route was forged in the footsteps of those who came west to build a new life and a new nation. Near today what is known as Maxwell, both the Oregon and California trails paused at a place known as Cottonwood Springs. It was just a seep in a gully near the mouth of Cottonwood Canyon, an old bed of the Platte River, and the only spring for miles. A fort was built here in October of 1863 to protect travelers from frequent Plains Indian raids in the Nebraska Territory and became known as Fort Cottonwood or Post Cottonwood. The name was changed to Fort McPherson in 1866 in honor of Major General James B. McPherson and was finally abandoned in 1880. During its tenure, historical figures like Buffalo Bill Cody and General George Armstrong Custer frequented the fort. Many things pass into history, but the cottonwoods remain. A water tower marks the town of Maxwell. Just west of town, the old Lincoln Highway crosses over the Triple Track Main Line, giving us a great view of UP 6578 West, the train we saw earlier parked near the Wayside Detector east of Platte River. It passes an empty coal train parked on Main 1 at East Keith. On a different day, we move down to track level in time to catch a westbound Z train led by UP 3030, an EMD SD70H T4 built in 2016. West Maxwell Road cuts off the Lincoln Highway and follows the south side of the main lines into town. Right on the heels of the Z, a westbound grain train led by UP 7971 heads through Maxwell on Main 1. The train slows for congestion ahead as it nears Keith.
Maxwell was incorporated as a village in 1908, being platted by the railroad when it first arrived in 1894. Before that, it was a trading post and Pony Express Station 21, which was later used by the Overland Stage. When Fort McPherson was in operation, the town had a hotel run by John Mac McCullough, who served drinks there. It is said that when soldiers came for mail and supplies, they would water their horses and have a drink at Max Well. The name stuck. In May of 2000, the town made headlines when it was struck by an F3 tornado. On the railroad, this is simply milepost 270.3. UP 7857 heads west on Main 2. The tangent track continues on a southeast heading east of Maxwell, following the unseen Platte River to the south. UP 8324 leads a westbound empty coal train past the hold signal at milepost 268.1, where another empty coal train is tied down on Main 2. UP 5717 brings up the rear of the train as it passes the parked coal train at CPB 268, two miles east of Maxwell. Right on its blocks, a second coal train led by UP 6771 heads west. Its power configuration is 2 by 3 by 1.
An eastbound stacker passes behind the coal train on Main 3. Less than a minute after the coal train clears, UP 5841 leads a Z train east on Main 3. A pair of GEs are cut in three quarters back. The signal hut guards the control point of CPB 263, known as Pawnee on the timetable. This is another set of crossovers tying all three mains together. Supersized switch heaters stand off to the side of the mains and are used for keeping switch points free of ice and snow during the winter months. For several days, this double coal train led by UP 5773 has been tied down on main one. We noted the head end was just shy of milepost 263, while the rear DPU was near the east end of the town of Brady, near milepost 260, three miles away. As we arrived at Pawnee, a crew was just getting on board, so we set up to catch the massive train as it got underway. Like other coal empties we saw earlier, this train has mid-train DPUs, EMD SD70 Ace number 8656 and GE C44 AC number 6620.
UP-5855 operates by remote control, receiving commands from the engineer three miles away in the cab of UP-5773. Union Pacific's triple track main isn't known for its scenery. The one exception to the mostly tangent track is found two miles east of Brady, where the railroad bends through a few small hills. A series of curves are known as the Brady Curves, or Buttermilk Curves. UP 5953 West leads a train of empty coal buckets through the curves on Main 2. The second unit is in rare Southern Pacific colors. UP-7333, a GE C6044AC, is the lone DPU on the empty coal train. With the newer paint job, these old GE convertibles can almost pass for a newer Jeevo, although the massive radiator hanging over the rear porch is one of the giveaways. The nickname Buttermilk Curve dates back to the pre-war years when refrigerated cars loaded with milk cans negotiated these tight curves. It was said the swaying of the cars churned the contents to buttermilk. A few minutes behind the coal train, UP-8700 leads a manifest through the buttermilk curves on Main 2. Train count on the Kearney sub was around 60 per day during our visit in the summer of 2021. It is a far cry from its heyday when rail fans recorded an average of one train every 10 minutes. But still, we don't have to wait too long to see some action. It was about 15 minutes later when we heard UP 8631 West approaching on the well-used number 2 track.
Although lacking in scenic mountain vistas and majestic waterfalls, we still found some beauty at Brady Curve with the ever-present wild sunflower, an ancestor of the domesticated variety. It is found throughout the southwestern U.S. and considered an invasive plant in some states. This view of the curve is right off the shoulder of U.S. 30. UP 7942 leads a mixed manifest east on Main 3. There are cattle grazing in the area, and we hear a cow bawling for her calf as the train approaches. Let's get an aerial perspective of Brady Curve. UP 5797 leads an eastbound stack train between Brady and Farr on Main 3. This view shows the hills the railroad must negotiate through and the reason for the curves. They are somewhat reminiscent of the sand hills in north central Nebraska. UP 6679 is our next eastbound with a double coal train in tow. Highway 30 parallels the railroad on the north side, while Interstate 80 loosely maintains course to the south.
Gothenburg is milepost 248.8 on the Kearney subdivision. The Farmland Service grain elevators are switched by this rare SD20, lettered MJRX 1021. It was originally built for the Southern Railway as an SD24 in October of 1959. This engine has called Gothenburg home for the past several years. Another monster coal train is heading our way, powered by eight engines in a 2x4x2 arrangement, led by UP7413. The train heads east on the number three track. Named for Gothenburg, Sweden, the town was founded in 1882 by Olaf Bergström, who homesteaded here and worked for the UP. A thunderstorm is making its way across the prairie, darkening the sky and bringing with it heavy winds. With the sunset blotted out by the storm, the warm headlight promises an eastbound at Gothenburg. A diverging clear on Main 2 is lit for an eastbound that will be long in coming tonight. Due to a high wind warning, Omaha Dispatcher 21 has told several trains to sit tight until the storm passes. And so, this day of rail fanning draws to a close. On a much nicer day, UP 4014 is seen again as it races out of Gothenburg on Main 3.
thunderclouds boil in the sky above the old dilapidated grain elevator at Willow Island. This is the midpoint between the towns of Gothenburg and Kozad. The community gained a post office in 1874, which operated until 1991. Nebraska is in the middle of Tornado Alley, and we are mindful of the sky. As a summertime thunderstorm gains strength, a high green beckons a westbound through Willow Island on Main 2, and UP 8404 approaches on a dark summer afternoon. UP 6811 West is right on its heels with a short string of grain hoppers. With the two westbounds out of view, all is quiet and still on the once busy triple track main. The drumming of big diesels and steel wheels is replaced with nature's percussion as lightning splits the Nebraska sky. To capture a nice train image, you need just three ingredients – location, lighting, and of course a train. We have two of the three just east of Willow Island. The storm appears to have subsided, and the evening sun is finding its way through the clouds, basking the countryside in warm light. In long intervals in between trains, it is easy to get impatient and move somewhere else. But if you wait and stick it out, you may get more than you bargain for. That's about to happen here. The signal just went hot on Main 3. Something is coming from the west. Weather can change rapidly, and this calm summer evening is about to get interesting. The storm that we thought had subsided was coming back with a vengeance that started with a light breeze from the south. As the headlight appears, something doesn't look quite right with the approaching train. 30,000 tons of coal are coming at us, and the slight breeze quickly turns into a gale. The engineer tries to warn the camera crew with his horn what's about to happen, but right now there is nowhere to go. As the storm blows coal out of the gondolas, you can hear it hitting the rail, the ballast, and the camera. To protect his eyes, the camera operator kept one eye shut and the other glued to the camera's eyepiece.
As luck would have it, this coal train is a double. Fortunately, the second half of the coal train wasn't as bad. We speculate that either the coal on the second section had been sprayed or the wind had died down just enough to make a difference. While the camera operator tries to get coal out of his hair, ears, nose, shirt, pants, and travel mug, we pause for a moment to show you this serene image. Setting up at Kozad, the coal dust is washed away with a pounding rain from the south as UP 8388 takes a manifest west on Main 2. The storms are over and we'll have smooth sailing on the remainder of our trek across the Kearney Sub. Kozad is milepost 238.2 on the UP timetable. This caboose and depot are on display just north of the tracks. The depot was built in 1925 and served the UP until 1990 when it was turned over to the Kozad United Way to be used as a community center. In the process, the depot was turned around to face Highway 30, rather than the railroad. The city proudly marks the 100th meridian, which is 100 degrees west of the prime meridian of Greenwich, a line of longitude extending between the north and south poles. It is identified as the boundary between the humid eastern U.S. and the arid western plains. During the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, UP track crews arrived at the 100th meridian on October 15, 1866. This was a huge milestone, as President Abraham Lincoln had stated that the first railroad to reach the 100th meridian would win the right to build toward California. Of course, you probably know the rest of the story. Today, trains pass through Kozad without any fanfare, just as they have for the past 150 years.
A gravel country road parallels the tracks east of Kozad toward the next station of Dar. We are deep in the heart of farm country and center pivots irrigate crops on both sides of the railroad. Nebraska is known as the Cornhusker State, growing more corn than any other crop. Besides corn, it ranks fifth in the nation for soybean production and produces wheat, cover crops, grain sorghum, dry beans, sugar beets, forages, and the like. At Dar, UP 7621 leads westbound empty coal buckets back to Wyoming's Powder River Basin for another load of black diamonds. There is always maintenance to do on a triple track main, and a ballast regulator heads west on main two. Another double coal train heads east behind UP 3081.
We touch back down again near the elevators at Dar, elevation 2,451 feet. Like many small unincorporated communities along the railroad, Dar once had a post office, but it was short-lived, operating between 1902 and 1923. The community was named for George B. Dar, the original owner of the town site. UP 4014 heads east through Dar toward a station stop at Kearney. Post 231 puts us between Dar and Lexington on a hot summer afternoon. UP 4542 and 829 are returning west toward North Platte after working at Lexington. The GP 38 2 drowns out the bigger SD 70M as it works hard on the slide uphill grade. A large water tower welcomes visitors to Lexington, milepost 224.4 on the Kearney Sub. The town began life as a frontier trading post along the Platte River in 1860. Later, it was the site of Fort Plum Creek, a Pony Express stop until 1861. The city was founded in 1874, and the name was changed from Plum Creek to Lexington in 1889. Like many towns along the Triple Track Main, a walkway has been constructed so pedestrians can safely cross the tracks. At the east end of town, we again catch up with the local as it switches tank cars for Chief Ethanol. A former Cornhusker energy plant in Lexington was purchased by Chief in 2016. The company also owns an ethanol plant in Hastings, Nebraska, and produces a combined 120 million gallons of fuel from the two plants each year. The placard 1987 indicates these cars contain ethanol.
There is a lot of industry along the Kearney Sub, and locals like this are called as needed. Crews have referred to these locals as pickers, as they pick a lot of cars up along the route. With the switching complete, the UP4542 is now pointed west and slowly departs Lexington for North Platte. Big Boy 4014 is framed by the signal bridge at milepost 223.25 as it heads through Lexington. At Overton, a trackmobile owned by CHS Co-op has just finished shuttling hoppers at the grain elevators. The Co-op has over a dozen elevators in South Central Nebraska, three of which are on the Kearney Sub. The other two are at Elm Creek and Kearney. We arrive at 5 o'clock and the town siren announces it's quitting time. UP 8210 leads a manifest for North Platte. Notice the number board is missing on the engineer's side, exposing the LED lights underneath. Between Lexington and Odessa, the railroad and Highway 30 maintain a nearly tangent course, nearly due east. The grain elevators for Elm Creek rise in the background. A high green on Main 3 promises a westbound local which works between Kearney and Lexington. It is running wrong main with no opposing traffic this evening. Two SD40Ns number 1808 and 1845 power the train.
We are just west of Elm Creek at control point CPB-206 with the name Agrex. It serves a grain storage facility owned by the Kearney Area Ag Producers Alliance, where corn and soybeans are stored and shipped on the UP. UP 7762 heads east into Elm Creek on Main 2. This manifest is running one by one by one. Norfolk Southern GEVO number 8147 works as a mid-train DPU, or distributed power unit. UP 6883 handles the rear of the train. Eastbounds are lined onto all three mains. A second manifest led by UP 7453 approaches Elm Creek on Main 3. Not far behind the manifest, UP 8007 heads east on Main 1 with a short stack train. The mid-train DPs aren't far behind the lead power. UP 8235 leads eastbound coal loads through Elm Creek on Main 3. The village of Elm Creek came into being in August of 1866 with the building of the Transcontinental Railroad through Buffalo County, Nebraska. It was first a siding along a creek with red elms growing on its banks. As people began to settle near the Elm Creek siding, the name stuck and the village was incorporated in 1887. Many of the town's streets are named for homesteaders. 
UP 9021 heads east through Elm Creek with a surprise in its contest. If you look carefully, there is a bay window caboose hiding in the train. Too bad it wasn't on the end. Between Elm Creek and Odessa, another four signal masts guard the mains at milepost 202. A meet is about to unfold, something that was once a lot more common on the triple track main. UP 8182 takes a stack train west on main one. UP 5733 lends a hand mid-train. Soon, UP 8324 East appears on Main 3 with a coal train. It meets the rear of the stack train just as it approaches our location. UP 5585 leads westbound coal empties past mile marker 196 between Odessa and Kearney. This is approximately the southernmost point on the subdivision as the Platte River takes a more northeasterly heading to Grand Island.
Kearney is milepost 188.8 on the railroad and holds claim to the geographic center of America, or at least the lower 48 states. One of the town's nostalgic features are the streets laid with bricks. This is the heart of downtown Kearney's shopping district and a real attraction. The bricks date back to 1915. The city of Kearney was facing a problem of muddy streets plagued with ruts, as depicted in this photograph taken around 1909. Gravel wouldn't be much of a fix, and concrete was deemed too expensive at the time. So, the city went with bricks. Shop owners in downtown Kearney paid between $40 and $50 each to cover the cost. Over 100 years later, it is safe to say they got their money's worth, as people still enjoy Kearney's unique atmosphere of downtown on the bricks. Founded in 1897 at the junction of the Burlington and Missouri River Railroad and the UP, it was originally named Kearney Junction. Named for General Stephen Watts Kearney, the extra E in the name was the result of a postal spelling error that has stood the test of time. Crossing gates at Central Avenue are activated for UP 9087, taking more coal loads east. While visiting Kearney, it is worth a stop at the Trails and Rails Museum on West 11th Street. Among the historic buildings from Buffalo County that are preserved is the UP Depot from Shelton, located east of Gibbon Junction on the Kearney Sub. The depot was built in 1898 and has three rooms, a waiting room for passengers, the agent's office, and the freight room. The agent sent and received messages via telegraph and operated the semaphore train order signals as needed. The depot was moved to its current location in 1975 after being donated by the UP, along with the 280 steam locomotive number 481. These were the first display pieces for the Trails and Rails Museum and were on hand in time for our nation's bicentennial in 1976. Another relic from a bygone era sits in the weeds at Gibbon, milepost 175.6. Named for Major General John Gibbon, it was founded in 1871 by a group of settlers consisting mostly of Civil War veterans. Today, the town has a population of just under 2,000, most of whom are still asleep as we go trackside in the pre-dawn dark. A headlight announces an eastbound Z train which has high greens on Main 2 as it approaches the end of triple track at Gibbon Junction. Gibbon Junction is milepost 175.1. The Marysville subdivision splits off to the south to Kansas, while the Kearney sub continues as a double-track main line to Grand Island, around 30 miles to the east. 
A red over flashing green is for the approaching UP 5472 West, which is coming off the Marysville sub. The empty coal train will be routed onto Main 1 for its westbound journey to North Platte. It's going to be a busy morning at Gibbon Junction. The glow to the west is the headlight for UP 2578, which is leading a manifest train toward Grand Island. As the train continues east on the Kearney subdivision, the Nebraska sun finally breaks over the horizon. Gibbon Junction is no more than a railroad junction in a corn patch along the old Lincoln Highway. In the middle of the Y, UP maintenance of way equipment is staged, and a crew is busy this morning preparing for work in between trains. Our next eastbound is headed for Kansas. UP 8839 leads a stack train onto the Marysville sub on the near track, sounding bells and whistles for men and equipment and us.
As the golden hour sets in, let's get an aerial perspective of Gibbon Junction. This view is looking east, with the Kearney sub heading straight to the left and the Marysville sub curving off to the right. There is also a third leg of the Y in the distance, which will soon be occupied. Looking east along the tangent track of the Kearney sub, UP 7905 slowly heads west on Main 2, with an ethanol train just picked up in Wood River 11 miles to the east. The train is bound for Kansas and will soon be taking the third leg of the Y to enter the Marysville sub as soon as traffic clears. We get a good slow roll by of UP 3026 and SD 70 AH T4. It is powered by a four stroke EMD 12 cylinder 1010 engine with a two stage turbocharger system. The engine is rated at 4400 horsepower and is capable of producing 200,000 pounds of tractive effort. Production of these engines that comply to strict EPA regulations began in 2016. And to date, UP has nearly 100 of these units, many of which have been in storage until recently. The train comes to a stop until UP Dispatcher 22 is ready for it to enter the Marysville sub. While we wait, UP 8178 takes a grain train west on Main 1. Right behind the grain train, another westbound approaches Gibbon Junction on the Marysville sub. UP 5830 leads a long string of empty coal buckets for eastern Wyoming. Below us is UP's maintenance of way yard.
The empty coal train is powered by six engines running two by three by one. Back on the ground, an eastbound loaded coal train led by UP 5773 heads for Grand Island. It crosses over to Main 1 to get past the waiting ethanol train. We caught the 5773 on the point of a double coal train at Pawnee a few days ago. It was apparently split up before returning east. As it approaches, UP 7905 begins to crawl through the Y. With the switch lined for Main 2, the 7905 slowly enters the Marysville sub, looping its train through Gibbon Junction. As the train continues railroad east toward the Kansas state line, we stay at the junction for a few more trains. UP 8494 leads a stack train west from Grand Island.
UP 8455 East leads its string of grain empties onto the Marysville sub. This is our last encounter with Big Boy as the Steam Special diverges onto the Marysville sub for the rest of today's run to Fairbury, Nebraska, around 100 miles to the southeast. Leaving Gibbon Junction behind, let's continue our final 30-mile run to Grand Island on the Kearney Sub. At Shelton, just off the main line, a retired M60 tank sits on display. The small town appears on the timetable as milepost 169.9. Earlier, we saw the old Shelton Depot when visiting Kearney. The railroad continues in a northeasterly heading to Wood River where we find the origin point of the ethanol train, the Green Plains Wood River Biorefinery. Nebraska has gone from one single ethanol plant in 1985 to 25, with a combined capacity of 2.5 billion gallons, making Nebraska the second highest ethanol producing state. These plants use more than 700 million bushels of corn per year and produce more than 6 million tons of distiller's grains used for cattle feed. UP 8842 leads a coal train through Wood River on track one. Welcome to Grand Island, Nebraska, the easternmost point on the Kearney Sub. UP 8652 and CSX 367 lead a manifest train into town on a busy morning.
The train meets UP 8757 West. The town began on an island, once formed by the Plant and Wood Rivers. Up to 70 miles long and 3 miles wide, it was known by French traders in the late 1700s as La Grand Isle. German settlers moved to the island from Davenport, Iowa in 1857. Surveyors for the Union Pacific laid out a nearby town site, calling it Grand Island Station, and many settlers living on the island resettled there. The rails arrived in 1868, and the town grew and prospered. It was incorporated as Grand Island in 1872. As the train slowly marches out of town, an eastbound BNSF coal train can be seen in the distance flying over the UP, a common sight in Grand Island. The main attraction in town is where BNSF's Ravenna subdivision flies over the UP. A Nebraska Central train is grabbing a string of tank cars out of the UP yard, giving us an under, while BNSF 8525 takes a manifest train west, providing the over. This line primarily sees coal trains heading to and from Wyoming's Powder River Basin, so manifest trains like this are a bit of a treat. A pair of red SD40-2s lead a cut of ethanol tank cars out of the UP yard. The Nebraska Central is a short line that operates on over 300 miles of former UP and BNSF track. Headquartered in Norfolk, Nebraska, it is a network of branch lines that all tie into the UP. These SD40-2s are of Burlington Northern heritage.
the NSF's Ravenna subdivision is quite busy, and it isn't long before a string of coal empties head west. Grand Island became a crossroads for rail traffic in 1884 when the Burlington and Missouri River Railroad pushed a line north from Lincoln, Nebraska to Billings, Montana, crossing the UP right here on a diamond. The railroad became the CB&Q and later the Burlington Northern. By the early 1990s, the increase in traffic on both lines created quite a bottleneck and Grand Island became the busiest railroad intersection in America. The problem was finally solved with the construction of this flyover, which saw its first train on July 27, 1995. Within a few minutes, another coal train is heard approaching. UP 2538 East heads through Grand Island on Main 2 including a BNSF unit of its own. From the north side of the mains, you can see into the small yard. Grand Island is a division point where trains enter the Columbus subdivision for the next 100 miles to Fremont and on to Omaha. Visiting the once incredibly busy railroad intersection in the summer of 2021, we were hoping for an over-under, something that was once very easy to do in years past. After a lull of traffic due to a work window on the UP, we get our final train of the day. UP 5314 East takes a long manifest train under the BNSF on Main 2. Shortly after the mid-train remote passes, we finally get our wish. BNSF 9078 West leads an empty coal train over the UP, running 3x3. Three three. A fitting end to our tour of Union Pacific's Kearney Sub. As always, until next time, thanks for watching.